a great warship, a crew of 5,800. They will take this ship on a six-month, 45,000-mile odyssey to the Persian Gulf, into the eye of danger. is the story of the carrier Carl Vinson and Argonauts of our time. Do you miss me yet? I love you. Do you miss me yet? As they board the ship in San Francisco, the sailors know they will not see their loved ones for six months. There are no Navy women in the crew on this voyage. It's extremely painful leaving your, your kids knowing that you will not see your wife or your children for six months and then come back and, and almost expect everything to be normal. It will not be normal. The young ones, they don't really understand yet, which is good, but that's just part of daddy's work gotta go. I love you. When the Carl Vinson takes to the Pacific, her aircraft are still on shore. The crew comb the flight deck. We try to get several hundred people to scour the deck looking for small metal objects. Gas turbine engines are very susceptible to uh, damage to their blades and the compressor sections by ingestion of foreign objects. And even as little teeny rivets can totally damage an engine. The cost runs between about sixty-five dollars to $75,000 to repair. Landing a plane on a carrier is no less difficult and dangerous than the act of a high-wire performer, a life-or-death test of skill, involving dozens of men on the flight deck and below. Unlike normal landings at airports, carrier pilots do not cut power as they slam the plane down. Instead, they hit full throttle. If they miss the cables, they have to have enough power to take off again. Crucial to getting the planes aboard are LSOs, the landing signal officers. From an exposed position on the stern, they radio instructions to the pilots. They also grade every pilot on every landing. What we're shooting for here is put your aircraft moving at 150 miles an hour, 50,000 pounds of aircraft. Putting it on a four by four foot block of steel moving at 30 miles an hour. Little, uh, little low, full flow, low flow, low flow, low flow, All the pilots have done this before, but sometimes there's just isn't enough concentration. You'll have deviations in lineup, deviations in airspeed. And that's where the LSO comes in. If he's not meeting the requisite parameters to come aboard safely, I'll be there to keep him off the ramp. Wave off, go around, and he knows he'll try it again. 
Fica no rosto. Fica no rosto. Fica no So platform, we're really exposed to all the aircraft coming in on approaches. And if one of them were to get out of control and it looks like they're either gonna hit the ramp or, well, crash into the platform, we've only got one place to go. Three, six, zero, Hornet. The weight setting for each landing plane must be entered on the battery of four arresting cable engines below. to make sure that the engines are set properly, to make sure that the gear is in battery, to confirm that the landing area is clear, and to confirm that the aircraft that's about to land is the same one that we have the weight setting set for. If you know what you're doing, it's not as dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, it's really dangerous. You just gotta know what you're doing and watch what you're doing. If one broke, it'd probably kill a lot of people. It would, the plane would go over the side and you know, it'd just, it'd be chaos. I mean, there would be a lot of people dead. And it'd be a lot of damage and I just don't want to ever see that happen. The massive hydraulic piston and 2,000 feet of cable absorb a 55,000 pound controlled collision between plane and ship. He's getting calls on his phones telling him what weights to set. They're also letting him know the location of the aircraft. When he says uh, groove, it means the aircraft's getting ready to come in. It's real short. And he'll say short. That means everybody's got to clear away from the equipment, get their hands out of it, whatever they're doing. And then he says over the ramp or ramp means the aircraft is actually coming over the ship and ready to engage the equipment. Get ready to catch another airplane right now in less than 45 seconds. Sure. Sure. And his day starts and it runs about 14 to 18 hours, goes on seven days a week and we're in sea. There's no second chance here. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's right, everything works fine. And if it's wrong, then people lose their lives. These are the people we trust for their lives right here. With the aircraft now aboard, the Carl Vinson and her battle group represent the most awesome concentration of mobile power in the history of the world. Her aircraft missiles can destroy ships and planes hundreds of miles away. Bombers can pinpoint targets or obliterate cities. She is a phenomenon of the 20th century's lust for power. One third of the crew is replaced each year. The captain greets the new arrivals. I'm Captain John Payne. I'm the commanding officer of the Carl Vinson. I have been for about uh, 26 months or so. My background has been in aviation, as all commanding officers and executive officers of carriers uh, must be. I want to talk now about the Carl Vinson herself. We're a big ship, 258 feet wide at the flight deck, about 150 feet at the waterline. The fastest ship in the United States Navy, practically. Greater than 30 knots, four catapults. Accelerate airplanes from zero to 170 miles an hour in two and a half seconds. Arresting at the other end, over 344 foot of run out will stop a plane from 170 miles an hour to zero in about two and a half seconds. The Carl Vinson is 1,100 feet long. From the bottom of our keel to the top of our mast, 24 stories tall. 17 of those stories have spaces that people can work and live in. If we stood on end, we'd be as tall as the Empire State Building is in New York. Are we the largest ship in the world? One of your colleagues in the back said the Abraham Lincoln's a little bigger. He must have served on the Abraham Lincoln and still have a little loyalty. Abraham Lincoln is heavier, so she displaces more water, and it's legitimate to say she's a heavier ship. However, if you notice up on our flight deck, we have a little extension off catapult number one that's 15 feet long. Abraham Lincoln does not have that. 
So we are 15 feet longer than the Abraham Lincoln. Slim Pickett, 25, is one of 65 aviators called Nuggets who are making their first deployment on this voyage. In a war, Slim will be an out front target of the enemy. In peacetime, he's paid to fly, and that is what he loves to do. I've always wanted to be a pilot. Uh, when I was a little kid, I used to go uh, with my dad. Uh, he'd take us to air shows every once in a while. And I got to see the Blue Angels, and I always thought uh, that would be a super neat thing to do, uh, be a pilot. I'm kind of excited about being here, and going right out on a cruise is kind of neat, because this is what it's all about, really. I mean, the reason we're here is so that we can be deployed and uh, go out and uh, do what we're trained to in various parts of the country and have an impact on uh, events in the world. So I am happy to be here at this point. Some of the new guys will be getting uh, some new guys. As a nugget, uh, pressure on Slim is high. The pilots are briefed for one of the first flights of the deployment. And looked at the bomb was loaded and found in there sometime with the way the weapon was loaded in the fusing where it came off a of dead. Okay, now we're going where it's for real and we really can't afford to do that. So that'll be the standard. One of the first things I do when I get a, a new pilot like Slim is I assign him to a, uh, a more senior individual. Slim happens to be assigned to me uh, for this cruise. I am his, what's called an on-wing, and uh, I will take him through the various stages of not only carrier, carrier environment, carrier flying, but also uh, strike flying and uh, fighter flying as well. I uh, have AIM-9 selected. Go ahead and FOX-2, uh, continue. We'll uh, start the maneuver in there. I'll hold my turn at 300 knots, uh, turning it, uh, increasing the turn slightly to allow you to rendezvous on me. Carrier tire pressure? 350 in all tires, PSI. Okay, and the rule of thumb for a cap for a missile? Classify. Classify. Okay. Lieutenant Pickett has been on active duty for four years. His training has cost the government two million dollars. He's flying a 35 million dollar F-8 18 Hornet off the deck of a billion dollar carrier that cost 440 million dollars a year to operate. Have a good flight. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, I just didn't get this F-14 with the uh, combined hydraulic fluctuations early. Although there are many people who have the decision-making capability, I'm ultimately responsible for it, and therefore I'm the one who wants to be here to, uh, to, to execute it uh, and make sure things go the way I feel most comfortable. It's not uh, an ego trip as much as it is just a, an acceptance of the responsibility. Not only is it a feeling of wanting to be here during the most uh, potentially risky times, uh, that is the launching and recovery of airplanes, it also is uh, uh, one of the best seats in the house. Uh, the best view uh, of the ocean and uh, a beautiful day like today. Why sit in an office if you can sit in a chair like this and, and watch flight operations? Slim is ready, but the shooter won't launch the plane until Slim signals with a salute. competition between the pilots. Most important competition is, of course, the uh, landing grades. You may go out and have a great flight, but uh, uh, your landing performance grade, that's going to stick with you the longest of anything because uh, everybody in the whole ship is watching you land. may think he made a good landing, but he has to hope the LSOs saw it that way. Okay, next up was our uh, 1v1 today. Uh, we went and started with a uh, butterfly setup. Out there, I'll take these. 
Okay, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the uh, film there and, and see how that went. The gun sight image tells the story of the dogfight. A square shows the track of the target. It's about 2,000, 2,000 feet is where you were clear to maneuver. Probably the smartest thing to do, and you want to get the quickest kill, was to bleed me down at the, uh, at the initial turn. So what you do is you, you, you add, light, add time to my life there, where to adding time to kill. Uh, overall, nice job, but to remember on your game plans there, it, uh, what you did is you allowed me to, to live another 30 seconds, whereas if you had killed me a little bit quicker, you probably could have got away. The longer you stay engaged, the greater your chances are you're going to get shot by somebody else. Okay, here's the uh, LSOs here. Let's go ahead and get our pass real quick. The pilots are hoping to receive a grade of OK, which means excellent. A uh, little high start to middle, a little sudden close, a little fat to ramp, OK three bar. Okay. Nice job. And uh, let me in there. 303. Uh, 60 second interval, what we're looking for is uh, 55. Uh, a little too much power in close, a little high at the ramp, OK three, nice pass. Really nice job. The stingers coming up here. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling First you. pass is right, thanks. Exactly. thanks. Thank you. A great day for Nugget okay. Pickett. All right, thanks a lot. Good job out there. Nice pass. He's pushing me pretty hard. Uh, I got a little, uh, few, few more better passes than him. But if he does well, hopefully by the end of the cruise, uh, he should be uh, at my heels, if not uh, doing as well as I am. But I don't think he'll get to be as good as me. Not this cruise, at least. <laughs> Once a week, on average, as she sails the Pacific, the Carl Vinson rendezvous with an oiler for refueling. Now, from here on, if we need to slow up, don't worry about changing the radio until we pick off our 1,500 yards. Okay, we're going to take off. Okay, we're going to take off. Okay, we're going to take off. About once a week or so, we'll top off our fuel reserves to make sure we don't get too low. 1,400 yards. 16 knots. 105 feet of beam. Aye, aye. Underway replenishment is what gives the Navy its uh, great capability to stay on the scene anywhere in the world in international water without, without the support or service of, uh, of any external agencies. Uh, but Carl Vinson and uh, her sister ships are nuclear powered and clearly do not require uh, fuel uh, for their own propulsion. But the aircraft that operate off of our ships require jet fuel and lots of it. Good morning, Captain Belfie and the crew of the USNS Pecos. It's a pleasure to be alongside on this bright and early morning. On Pecos, stand by to receive shot lines forward and amidships. First attempt. Aboard Carl Vinson. With the proper exchange of signals, send over shot lines forward and amidships. both the wave action, the pressure forces as ships move uh, into position and away from position, the detensioning and the tensioning of the high lines and span wires, all of those things have an impact on our, uh, on our steering that have to be handled with very minute corrections in heading and in, uh, in speed changes. We have four shafts on this ship and we're changing the revolutions per minute by one RPM to maintain our position fore and aft. We're changing our heading in half degree increments. The dynamics of uh, having two large ships alongside at fairly close proximity is one of the great ship handling challenges of the modern Navy. To have a 95,000 ton ship uh, stabilized alongside a 50,000 ton ship with other ships coming alongside uh, as well uh, has uh, some level of stress associated with it. Counting us right now is uh, Commander Crisp, one of the uh, fighter squadron COs. Aviators uh, get to the point in their career where they're about done flying, and uh, as naval officers, they need to transition to the, uh, the grown-up task of driving ships. Isn't that right, Commander Crisp? That's correct. Put away a childish airplane flying. Hope not. Aviation uh, officers have a, have a great ability to judge uh, relative motion, which is one of the key problems in. Uh, and handling ships alongside like this.
today's evolution, uh, we uh, took on uh, one and a half million gallons of jet fuel uh, with our full load of over three million gallons, enough to drive your family car around the world, uh, I believe, 3,600 times. All engines ahead, full 110 RPM. All engines ahead, full 110 RPM. When Lieutenant Martinelli pushes the launch button that fires the catapult, he usually works from the safety of a protective bubble, but he also practices firing the planes from deck level. Then our next launch is going to be off the waist. The waist is probably the most exciting thing that we, shooters get to do because you're standing right there between catapult three and catapult four, and in some instances, the aircraft's wing actually goes over your head. For me, it's particularly exciting up here because it's kind of like playing football in one of the most dangerous fields there is, probably on Earth. We're going to get back here behind the center deck operator. We're going to select the CSV. It determines how much oomph the pilot's going to get when he when it gets launched. A wrong CSV setting will put an aircraft in the water. A wrong CSV setting has ripped the, the nose gear off an aircraft. We ensure that we have a cat ready indication. We have a CSV uh, confirmed, which would be by a low thumbs up. JBD's up, aircraft's configured for flight. The director's gonna hook them. I'm gonna observe the hook, check for a high thumbs up, and I'll acknowledge the pilot's indication that he's ready to go, and poof, he's gone. As soon as I do that, I run down there to prepare to launch the aircraft on Cat 4. They've now hooked him. I'm scanning the pilot and the troubleshooter. Troubleshooter says he's good to go. Pilot indicates that he's ready to go. Boom, final ready. We're getting set up for the next play. You get your helmet on, you have your uh, float coat on, which is kind of like a set of shoulder pads, and you set your CSV, like calling a play. And then, you go over and you actually execute the play by launching the aircraft. And then, as soon as I'm all done this launching evolution, I'm going to have to do a regular... Uh, who was a great running back? Mercury Morris sprint back to the arresting gear to get ready to, to catch the aircraft that are coming back from the previous launch. So it'll be real busy. This day, one of the F-14D Super Tomcats will make a supersonic flight. We don't get a chance to uh, fly supersonic as much as we'd like to because the sonic boom bothers a lot of people. But uh, when we get out to sea like this, we get a chance to do it. It's a, it's a ball. I've only done it about a dozen times. Got a couple different things we put on our bodies prior to uh, getting in the jet. This here is called a G-suit by basically blowing up with air using the jet blows up these uh, compartments here here and around your abdomen and that basically just keeps all the blood up into your upper extremities and your head where so that you don't black out and uh, lose consciousness next thing we put on here is the uh, torso harness in an ejection scenario this whole thing is going to basically keep you from uh, or keep you intact and it it's actually contoured to your back and your body so that as the uh, forces as you as the you separate from the seat and the uh, parachute uh, comes out and inflates and and you stop your downrange travel to the earth it's a kind of a shock and then what you do put this uh called the sv2 like a uh, a boat life preserver same same function keeps you floating in the water if you uh, end up getting in the water Lieutenant Strobel, the radar intercept officer in the back of Lucas's plane, operates the weapons system and communications. Uh, when I first climb into the jet, what I'm going to be looking for is I'll just take a quick sweep around the cockpit and make sure there's no loose uh, attachments or anything like that, no pod in the cockpit. Then I'll start looking over my ejection seat. 
And uh, this is the thing that we count on if we're ever going to have any problems with the, uh, the jet to keep us alive. And what it is, it's uh, a seat that has a couple of rockets attached to it. So basically we're sitting on a couple of rocket motors under this thing. Either one of us pulls our handle, the canopy will go first, then a half a second later I'll go, and then a second later he'll go. So this, then me, then him. And then we get shot out to different sides. My rocket exhaust will not burn him as I go up the rail. Lieutenant Lucas, 27, is a nugget on his first deployment. How's it going? How's things going, man? Good. All ready to go here? All right. I basically fly because I want to become an astronaut when I was young. And uh, once I found out that uh, being an astronaut and flying was all pretty much the same thing, it was uh, a natural step. F-14D is the most remarkable aircraft in the, in the inventory of the Navy. It's, uh, it's the fastest aircraft by far and the most powerful. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. One of the, one of the fun times that we, we like to try is uh, get some high speed, uh, high speed runs. We use afterburner for that. This, uh, this jet has uh, afterburner. Um, and there's, there's something about that that uh, is a real kick in the pants, literally. I mean, when you, when you plug that afterburner in and uh, start speeding up, you, you feel you feel the kick in the in your pants. I mean, you feel it actually kicking you. Boom, boom, boom. And each each time, you're, you're getting accelerated faster and faster and faster. And it's just uh, it's a real experience. It's, it's a ball. It's unusual for a plane to make a supersonic flight near the ship. An audience gathers on the island deck called Vulture's Row. heads for the ship and his supersonic flyby. Most crewmen have never heard a sonic boom. Like they're going to be just fine. We won't be to lose any airplanes at all. The 
fact that uh, this has come out apparently so well is something we ought to uh, feel real good about, and that's all. Oh, Whoa! Man. There we oh, go. There we are. Yeah. All right, there we go. Is that smoke right there? Uh, we just got to the bow of the ship at uh, 635 knots at 2,000 feet, and uh, we felt a big shudder, actually two big thumps. And uh, I asked Rick, uh, what was that? And he said, well, our right engine just stalled. So at that time, I said to the boss, boss, can you send the, the rescue helo over our way? Just in case anything got any worse, then we'd you know, have the helo following us around. And uh, uh, Which is very cool in that type <laughs> of emergency. How you doing? Uh, state of panic the man was in a smooth controlled yo bus and then he go our way and our wingman calls out your right engine's on fire and i couldn't even move the stick it was it was frozen it was a it, it felt like there was no hydraulics in the system at all i couldn't even move it and i determined well hey we're we have no control of this aircraft the, the tail end is burning and uh we're out of this thing as i reached for my handle and uh Set over the ICS jet, 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 jet. I'm thinking, I cannot believe this is happening. My first thought was, this isn't supposed to happen to me. I didn't see anything really, probably because my clo my eyes were closed. But I just felt this huge rush of air in my face, and I, I probably was screaming in my mask. The ejection itself was a lot more violent than I would have ever thought it would be. That is, without a doubt, the most violent experience I've ever gone undergone in my life and that uh, it's something I never want to have to do again either one once was too many times so one thing that I kind of missed out about this whole thing is uh, in, a couple of years ago in the Navy uh, when you were in medical getting your physical you would have gotten a nice shot of medicinal brandy but uh, the way things are going these days we didn't get one so we kind of got chipped out of that but <laughs> Lieutenant Twig LeBranch also survived a crash he and Lieutenant Commander Lepla have been flying for seven and 14 years, respectively. They share searing memories. So, I mean, uh, I'm lucky to be here. I mean, this is my ejection. And there I go. I go off the end of the bow right there, and uh, I realize that there's something wrong because the aircraft doesn't want to fly. It's wallowy and mushy and it's, uh, the control inputs I'm putting in aren't, aren't, aren't acting, are reacting the way I want them to. People were tell, screaming to me, climb, 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 and uh, the aircraft's not climbing. Um, they're screaming, eject, 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 and we get out, uh, me and my navigator get out sideways. You, you did eject sideways. It yeah. looks like you that skipped on the water like and then... When I initially got the word to eject, I had to hear it three times. I was so busy flying the aircraft that I wasn't interested in ejecting at the time. When I pulled the handle, I almost didn't pull it, I mean, because I knew it was too late. By the time I pulled the handle, the, the horizon was at 90 degrees, and I, I knew we were out of the envelope, so I, I didn't think I was going to survive, and I thought I was going to go neck first, and I didn't want to feel that. And, and to think, to, to ride the seat like that, it's a pretty violent ride. I was an inch shorter when they pulled me out of the water, a full inch. So um, it, was, it was blind luck. It wasn't my time. So I'm up in double digits with friends of mine that have passed. Most of the jets we fly are two-seaters. When you lose a friend, you lose them two at a time because either they both make it or they don't. You know, it, 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 it doesn't get any easier how many, how many times. I mean, the hardest part for me was losing my best friend. I mean, he, he, he meant a lot to me, and I, I, it, it was hard to, to, to believe that he was gone. And I had seen him a half an hour earlier, before he went flying. I, had, I saw him just before he briefed, said something to him in passing, something insignificant, you know. And had, had I known, I wish I could have said something. I, I don't know. It's like you, you, you go back and say, you want, you, want, you want that time back. You want him back. It's not going to happen, and you just hope that you learn from that. You see, now you're a source of information on an ejection situation, because you've gone through it and survived, and now you can instruct other people like me that have never been in that situation and, and help me understand what it's like. You know, if I ever face that situation, I may think about some of the things you say. That's, that's the purpose of safety stand-downs. That's the purpose of, uh, of us watching these, these films. I waited way too long. I was lucky. And, and, and we, all, we learned from that. And, and hopefully, uh, and I know it's the policy of our, our squadron is, hey, you know, not that we just 
chuck jets, but hey, make sure that if you're going to pull the handle, you pull the handle in time to save your life. You know, jets are replaceable, people aren't. As the ship nears Hawaii, the helicopter squadron trains for rescue missions with volunteer swimmers. And what we do once we see our survivor, and everybody's ready to go, we, uh, we've got the hoist ready and the crewman's all ready to go in the water. You know, we uh, descend in our altitude and uh, slow down, so we're at about 10 feet and 10 knots as we come over the survivor. 50 feet. Roger. 20 knots. Okay. 10 feet. Jump in and jump. In. Jump. Jump us away. Roger. Once our, our crewman jumps out, we'll back off uh, our hover about 20 or 30 yards so that the rotor wash uh, does not make it hard for him to work. That's a, that's, there's a lot of force from that, uh, from that downdraft. And he'll give us a hand signal when he wants for us to come back in and pick him up. He's in verbal control. And your verbal control. Roger, I verbal control, service survivor at 2 o'clock. Roger. Engaged, Roger. Roger, that's the survivor now. Roger. He's got power to survivor now. Roger. The SAR swimmer is holding on uh, to the survivor just to make absolutely sure we don't lose the guy back into the water. Halfway up. Roger. Approach to the cabin door. Roger. And uh, we depart our hover at that point and start heading back for the ship. Another rescue technique, if Marines need to be evacuated from a mission and there isn't room for a helicopter to land, all is not lost. From Hawaii, the ship heads west for stops in Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. plane captain you get your name on an aircraft this is my jet I'm responsible for it I'm got to make sure that it's set up ready for flight so all the pilots got to do is jump in there it's ready to go I got to make sure that nobody comes up here because the seats armed now uh, this is a safety pin so uh, say when we're doing maintenance on the jet and uh, you accidentally knock the, the ejection handle, if this pins in, nothing will happen. But as long as this pins out, the seat's armed up, and if anybody were to pull that, this ejection seat's gonna go out. So pretty much the pilot's just gotta get up here, jump in, start her up, take off. Good flight, sir. Stop for all personnel to shift into the proper flight deck uniform. Helmets on, goggles down, sleeves rolled down, light vest on, securely fastened. Check chocks, count on chains, this group out the deck and check for fog. And let's start the go aircraft. Start them up. The best way for the pilot and I to communicate is through hand signals. Uh, each hand signal has a different meaning. 
First of all, the pilot tells me to start up the APU. The APU goes off. Go, he starts up engine number two. Boom, start up engine number two. After that, start up engine number one. Start up engine number one. All right, both engines are going. Check the hydraulic system. Tell them they're good to go. Next, we initiate the flight control sequencing. This uh, lets all the flight control services uh, go crazy. And uh, this is to let everybody know that the flaps are moving and not to go underneath them. After that's done, tell them to open flaps. Then we check the horizontal stabilizers. Close the flaps. Then you tell them to open flaps halfway, set the trim. Then you tell them three down. This means that the launch bar, the tail hook, the speed brake, and the in-flight refueling probe will all engage. Then I do my walk around. This is the final check to verify that everything's good. There's no hydraulic leaks, no missing fasteners, anything like that. I go underneath the jet, get the code, see if there's anything wrong. Uh, if there is, the uh, computer will tell me. After that, I tell them to put three up. The tail hook, launch bar, speed brake, and IFR probe all go back inside. The final checkers will do their walk around, and they'll tell me, thumbs up, the jet's good to go. After that, I pass control to a yellow shirt, who will tell the pilot that they're going to break the chains down and pull the tocks out. That's when we take all the chains down and remove the tocks. Bird's on its way. 12 hours of intense responsibility and danger on the flight deck, then long corridors lead to Jorgensen's substitute for home and a few hours of free time. These are the uh, birthing areas where the crew gets to sleep. This right here is a 99-man birthing area. It's uh, quite small. They seem to shove a lot of people into this small area here. Got about nine people that live in this area right here. Uh, as you can see, you don't have a lot of space. The mattresses are only a couple inches thick. You got your divisional curtains for your privacy. Other than that, that's about it. We just all got off work, and this is where we sleep, so it's, it's like a relaxing place. No one else is here. It's time to shoot the breeze, be able to talk about things that happen during the day, things about what we're looking forward to when we get home, just all kinds of stuff. I can't wait to hit Australia. I'm sure another 2,000 guys can sympathize with that too. Amen. Okay. But more so, I like to hit home. <laughs> that goes without saying. You live this close to someone else, and and if you can deal with other people, that's fine. How these boat people, they say they love it, they can have it. I want off. Never. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds incriminating to me. That's yeah, it why. does. <laughs> no, I can say that because he that's can the say way that I because feel. by the time this airs, he'll be <laughs> out of here. Place where we can uh, sit and relax. Oh shit! Oh, come on! This is it. Let's go. <laughs> Get my cloud on now. Get it on. Get where it we on. at? You stole it. There you go, Daddy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. No. The cat got the space over here. That lost. <laughs> <No. laughs>
find a lot of different country people. I thought I was country, and there's there's a lot of different country other than Arkansas. Someone was telling me there was a, a two-lane bowling alley here. I, I looked for about two months trying to find that bowling alley, and to this day I haven't found it yet, so I don't guess there is one here. I've been pretty, mo pretty much all the way around this boat. All right. I've been on this boat over about a year and a half now, and I, I haven't seen the whole boat. I don't guess I ever will. There's no bowling now. <laughs> Just ropes and buckets. The average age of our crew is uh, something just around 21, maybe a little over that. I think people who join the Navy uh, to see the world or because it's more than a job, it's an adventure, as our uh, recruiting experts uh, say, uh, they finally get to a ship at sea. And I would say that probably 95% uh, percent of those who arrive here find it to be wildly different than they expected. The, the mental stress on people at every level manifests itself in a number of ways. Uh, we have very few cases of uh, clinical depression, but we have lots of uh, cases of mild depression. Our chaplains uh, not only run our religious programs, uh, but are probably uh, some of our best counselors. Cleaning bathrooms is as far apart uh, from what I thought I'd be doing. I've been in about a year and a half. What, what, why'd you come in? What, what, did you, what do you want to do? Uh, well, my original intent was to get money for college and hopefully, you know, get four years of college out of the way while I'm in the Navy. It just seems like a total waste of five years, you know, I'm in for five. And uh, what am I, I'm cleaning bathrooms. What is that gonna prepare me for on the outside world? If, you're, if you really wanna make fun of somebody, call them a lifer. Because uh, that's somebody who's gonna stay in and make a career out of the Navy. And there's, no, there's no worse of a cut down or, you know, make fun of somebody than to call him a lifer. Because that's just saying, yeah, he's straight up, he does everything just perfect by the Navy books. And, uh, other guys, guys like me and Glenn, that's, that's uh, just a joke. Well, are you going to be a lifer, Glenn? I'm a lifer. Oh, Glenn's a lifer. I'm having, I'm having positive results with the Navy. I guess it, it, it affects different people different ways, because I'm one of them lifers, you know, that they, they yell about around the, around the bird and, you know, I used to work construction, and here I am. I'm, I'm less than a mate. I'm a janitor. But I, I'm more intelligent than, than cleaning heads. I could, I could really be a functional part of the team. I could be helping these people, and instead, they're hindering me, and all they're doing is making me mad. I want to be an air traffic controller. And so I figured the only way to get, you know, schooling and, and on-the-job training and get paid while I'm doing it was to, you know, let Uncle Sam pay for it. I, I look at it this way. Coming in the Navy was the first biggest mistake of my life, and signing up for five years was the second. And the third corresponds directly with the two, because with the 768 bucks, I got on and got this tattoo, and I can't stand it. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't listen to these guys, because I... Okay, guys, let me explain, let me explain yeah, yeah, what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. In order to get this job done, feeding uh, 3,500 to 5,000 people, we have to start up forward, start preparing a forward about 10 this afternoon. 10 o'clock this afternoon, we started. We started prepping the pizza, and then I have these guys running back and forth, bringing pizza back here in order for us to put it in the oven. This is one of the type of meals that I really hate to make on a ship feeding 5,000 personnel, but we do it to please the personnel. Because we are about customer service. Because we are about customer service. Okay. Yes, yeah. so this is where most of the bulk of the work is right here. We have to keep cutting, taking the cans, ravioli, opening them, dumping them in the copper, and preparing them. The only way to get done, the only way to keep up is to stay ahead. If you fall behind, I'll jump in and I'll help these guys. That's my job. Sometimes we run out. And of course, we're not allowed to run out. He'll open it up and I'll grab it and I'll dump it in. We like the teamwork part the best. I start on the vegetables. It looks pretty good. I like spinach. I love spinach, as a matter of fact. I don't prepare everything I love just for myself, though. I prepare it for the crew. And I think the crew love, love spinach just as much as I do, so. Uh, I'm very proud to work under this man. Learn the expertise and knowledge. Work from 0, 0700 to 8, 9 o'clock at night every night. We have to keep everything hot 
or we'll make somebody sick. Yeah, sure. It's the uh, real lenient. Lenient? He looks mean to me. No, I'm not mean. I'm a nice guy. Today, all the Air Wing squadrons will take part in a simulated strike on Midway Island. But before the intense action begins, there is a brief moment for a crewman to contemplate the lonely sea and sky. It's going to be a simulated strike on the island of Midway, okay? You can see up here on the uh, monitor, Midway is up to the north, and we're about 250 miles south. Uh, we launch in 29 aircraft in two different waves. Uh, some of them are going to be carrying live uh, ordnance. None will be expended, but uh, just for practice. Working with models of the flight and hangar decks and cutouts of the planes, the handler lays out for his troops the sequence of plane movements before the launch. Deck control. Okay, they're only going to need to shoot one E2, so you don't have to pull 601. Okay, what we have happening is we have uh, aircraft, the 602 is down for maintenance, so he's not going to make this launch. We flipped him over to indicate that uh, the aircraft is down. We'll send him back aft, clear the catapults, and start uh, feeding uh, the rest of these planes up for our 1300 uh, launch. In the bowels of the ship, ordnance men prepare bombs and missiles. What you're looking at is a Sidewinder air intercept missile. You use it for air combat. The missile's been around for a while. It's proven itself in combat. They used a lot of them in Desert Storm. It's a tough critter. Uh, they fly them a lot. They come back, package them up in the cans send them somewhere else and fly them some more as far as how far it goes and how big the warhead is and all that. That's kind of all I can tell you. It's not every day that ordnance men get a chance to put some of these missiles together. A guy can get confused. Aviation ordnance men, the backbone of the Navy, of the Aviation Navy. Without us, there's no need to even have the airplanes. This is the uh, Air Launch Phoenix. This type of weapon here is what we call the over the horizon weapon. Each copy costs about a million dollars. This weapon got an unclassified range of over 100 miles that is flowing on the L-14. Okay, let's go and uh, raise the weapons rail and unlock the pins. There's always a chance of human error. If a cartridge accidentally goes off while you're uh, while you're loading this all this, the feet which jettison this weapon can injure somebody and stuff like that, and it would probably ruin your day. These are all different range missiles on this plane. You get this is a long range missile. This one's a medium range uh, Sparrow missile, and this is the short range AIM-9 Sidewinder missile. It's used for air to air and uh, dog fighting. This is the AMRAM, another air-to-air -air missile, a replacement of the Sparrow, both air-to-air. -air. The same weapon, this is an AMRAM. This right here is what we call the GBU-12, and it's a laser-guided type weapon, a laser beam. This is a Maverick, what we call a laser penetrator, is a beam rider, and it's used against all surface targets. This is the cluster bomb unit. Uh, we use this against any ground targets. Uh, it's a free-falling weapon that would explode. 
and release little bomblets from the inside of it. And each one of the little bomblets is about the same size as a grenade, but you will cover a large area of the ground with. All 264 aviators and 2,500 men of the squadrons are headed by the commander air wing, Captain Michael McCabe. When we launch a strike, it really begins with the E-2, which goes out ahead and creates a picture for the battle group and relays it back and does air surveillance of the target. The S-3B Viking functions against submarines, against other surface ships, as a tanker and as an electronic surveillance platform. The A-6 Intruder is a tremendous platform for delivering the laser-guided bombs which gained such acclaim in Desert Storm. The F-18 works very closely with the F-14s for the fighter mission and with the A-6s delivering weapons to the target. Our F-14D, the Super Tomcat, is the most capable air interceptor in the world. Our EA-6B Prowler is capable of defeating virtually every surface-to-air radar system, either through jamming or by shooting missiles at the target radar. The planes form up and head for Midway. The E-2 Hawkeye is the intelligence center reporting to the strike leader. In the fuselage, three officers can track 1,600 air and surface targets simultaneously at a distance of more than 300 miles. Our system displays to us in real time, 360 degrees around us, everything in the air and on the surface of the ocean for over 200 nautical miles. Here's the picture we have to work with in the E-2. Here's the carrier with the battle group. Here is the strike package in route to the target area along the strike route. Here is the target area. Here we have potentially hostile aircraft in the target area. As the strike package closes into the target and things start to get hot, the controller will work closely with the fighters, vectoring them onto the hostile aircraft so that they can be taken out so the strike package can safely ingress, put bombs on target. Our job's still not over up to that point. We must remain alert to ensure that hostile forces are not planning to come back and strike the carrier battle group. Back at the ship, officers in the combat area keep close track of the midway strike and also of the larger strategic scene. Red Crown, she's right overhead, so I'm not getting a good check. Red Crown, say 300, 304, sweet India, as of now. Why don't we turn again? I, I want to know how he's picking him out of that mob up at midway. If this were a real attack, missiles could have been launched from more than 100 miles out. Cluster bombs would have killed anyone above ground. Laser-guided missiles would have pinpointed the hangars. Each A-6 intruder could have dropped nine tons of bombs. In an ultimate war, a nuclear bomb could obliterate the island. Such is the awesome power we in the 21st century must live with. A swift passage through the Indian Ocean has brought the ship into the Persian Gulf. Attacks on the Carl Vinson could be launched from land masses only minutes away. Air crews and pilots are on call night and day. Okay, on the flight there, just a reminder, all hands, it's getting pretty hot up there. Temperature is at least 96 degrees. They're going to be going up in excess of 100 degrees today. Everybody take plenty of water in there. Make sure you stay in the shade when the opportunity presents itself. Start feeling tired, let somebody know. Whenever there's not aircraft airborne, you got to have the, the uh, ship in a defensive posture with uh, aircraft on the deck, and that's what we've been doing all night. It can get uh, pretty boring most of the time sitting out here in the middle of the night, but uh, things can get real exciting real quick, and that's why we're here. When the painting happens, we'd launch off the front end of the ship here and uh, go uh, out there and uh, take care of business. 
In the combat area, Admiral Clark, who commands the battle group, has instant access to an array of constantly updated strategic information. Our presence here is giving our allies, the, our friends in this region, confidence in the rebuilding in this post-war post era. But we're also here to perform a function. In the southern part of Iraq, the United Nations established the no-fly zone. And each day we're conducting operations enforcing that no-fly zone. And we have a dozen ships arrayed throughout the Gulf today. I have destroyers up there uh, to ensure that uh, no shipping goes into Iraq that has embargoed uh, goods on it. Several of our ships, including our submarine, are equipped with Tomahawk cruise missiles that can reach hundreds and thousands of miles into Iraq if need be. When people ask the question, why do we need carrier battle groups? This, this is one of the best answers that anybody could ever provide. We need carrier battle groups because they can go to regions like this and influence events throughout the world. And when the job is finished here, we can take this battle group and all of its influence and move anywhere in the world where we are needed. The Carl Vinson is maintaining a U.S. naval presence in the Persian Gulf that began in 1949 and culminated in the war with Iraq. Within a few days of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, a U.S. carrier battle group entered the area. During the Gulf War, 120 U.S. ships, including six carrier battle groups, destroyed the Iraqi Navy. Naval and Marine aircraft dropped seven million pounds of explosives and launched one-third of the 94,000 U.S. aircraft sorties during the war. Lieutenant Commander Leplov has vivid memories of the Persian Gulf. He was here during the war with Iraq. Uh, I was on the USS Midway, and this is the USS Independence that had just left the uh, Arabian Gulf. The people on that deck were exhilarated because they were going home. We were exhilarated because we were going into a potential battle zone. People were crying. About three months after this, we actually did fly into war. My particular squadron dropped uh, over 750,000 pounds of ordnance on the war and uh, really quite an amazing evolution. On previous bomb runs in mid-ocean, Lepla and his squadron used smoke signals in the water as targets. Today, there are bombing ranges available ashore in Kuwait. Um, obviously, stay away from towns. You don't want to buzz any of those camels, that type of thing. Uh, your job is not to, uh, to make their life difficult. Here you can see our uh, yellow shirt standing right in front of the airplane. He'll be our taxi director. Okay, he just passes off to another yellow shirt. Uh, you know, sometimes they're hard to see, but... Oh, okay, there he is. Okay, he's giving me the spread wing signal now. Uh, wings will be coming down. Okay, they're moving. And once they come down completely, I'll lock them in place. Okay, there he goes. All right, we're next. The jet blast deflector is coming down. That means it's our turn to taxi up. Okay, they're going to taxi us up onto the shuttle. All right, come forward a little bit now. You'll feel the airplane come up and then down to the launch bar. Okay, we're accelerating probably out to 400 knots or so. When we're out here in the Gulf, we're on call 24 hours a day. That means we fly usually every other day and engage in planning when we're not actually flying. Every exercise, every training mission that we engage in, we treat uh, as if we're going to war. Pretty barren out here. 
These uh, desert low levels are, are really rather insidious because, uh, well, the problem is you really have no great depth perception. All right, turning to the north now. In the turn, got to keep it low. Don't want a balloon. And the problem here is a trade-off uh, between going very high so that the enemy will see us or staying low, but uh, if you're going to stay low, you got to avoid the dirt, obviously. Okay, the Ford Air Controllers have a uh, handheld laser gun that they're actually uh, firing on the target as we ingress towards it. The uh, laser beam from that gun will bounce off the target, be received by our airplane, and then uh, the, com the onboard computer will then compute the distance and heading and display that to the, uh, the pilot. Okay, all right, I found the target. Stand by, stand by, there it goes. Okay, our mission is completed, but let's go ahead and head on home. Okay, I've got one, two, three, gear down and lock, visual slats, stab shifted, boards are out, hook is down, skid pops are off, hook bypass, interest, and we're ready to come aboard. The skill gained in such training places the squadron in ultimate readiness. During this deployment, 264 aviators will make over 7,000 flights. My wife will send me a, uh, a video of the children about uh, once every month. That's uh, my youngest, my little daughter, Susanna, and her swing. Flowers. The gardening she's been doing. There's a lot less weeding I'll have to do when I get home. There's my little daughter. Get that pretty smile. Look <laughs> <laughs> at the camera and say hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. I love you. I love you. <laughs> there were a couple of times that uh, I, I am a father. I wouldn't want anybody dropping bombs on my children and killing my children. Um, and, and I thought about it, you bet. Who, who can, who in their right mind or with a conscience could go into war and, and not think about what you're doing to other people? But on the other hand, you've got a job to perform and that's what you've trained all your life to do. When you're in the military, you are essentially a trained killer. You've accepted that. Your country is employing you to kill other people whom your country mandates should be eliminated, shall we say. That's when people like me and Jeff we fly in, we drop our bombs, we come back, and, and uh, maybe we feel a little bit of remorse, but we never let it get in the way of our jobs. It looks like a bomb, but actually it's a three-camera photopod. Flying surveillance this day is Lieutenant Mike Gordon, 28. We have to keep track of what the Iraqis are doing as far as uh, complying with the UN sanctions and also moving their uh, military equipment around. Main things we've been uh, taking imagery of lately are their uh, SAM sites that they're trying to up upgrade or move back into. Also a lot of the airfields, seeing if they're uh, completing construction on the runways that have been cratered and damaged and if they're moving any aircraft down south, which so far they haven't been as far as we know. Uh, now I'm flying the F-14D and I absolutely love this thing. You can accelerate from 300 knots up to about 600 knots in about 20, 30 seconds. You get the feeling of speed, the rush of uh, power. It's got 30,000 pounds of thrust per engine. Put them both into afterburner and you get about a G and a half to 2G uh, pushing you straight back into the seat. This has more moving parts than just about any other plane you'll ever find. But we're restricted in flying at fairly high altitudes because of the uh, lack of hostilities and the lack of any kind of risk. We're extremely busy with TARPS imagery up here in the Persian Gulf. After the Gulf War, TARPS became a paramount photo reconnaissance platform and its value was really, really noticed by the higher echelon. We get tasking from the U.S. Central Command 
and they give us a list of targets that they want us to image for that day. And the air crew will go ahead and fly the mission and return anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours later. Right now, it is the only forward deployed tactical airborne reconnaissance pod system left in the armed forces. Once the aircraft returns, the photographers mates download the film and they take it to CVIC, the Intel Center on board the aircraft carrier, where within five minutes to a half hour, depending on how much was shot, they process this film. It's the Tigris-Euphrates River, the cradle of civilization. When I was flying there during the desert storm, there was just massive carnage and uh, a lot of smoke, fire, oil slicks everywhere. It looked like an ecological disaster. You thought it was the, uh, the end of the world there when I saw it. Looks quite green now, though. Once that film is processed, it's taken immediately to a light table where photo interpreters go ahead and annotate the targets that were imaged by this pod. Once they image it, they go ahead and cut the negatives and they make hot prints. These hot prints are immediately taken to the Admiral for review, and at the same time, they're reviewing them. They're being digitized and transmitted to our end customer. Okay, the pilot and air crew usually come down. Uh, they play an important role in the debriefing process. They can help us locate the targets, especially since they overflew those areas. They know what we're looking for, and they know uh, how to help us find the spots where the target is supposed to be. So they have an important part in, uh, in the debriefing and uh, finding the targets on the film. You guys got all the 99, all about 40 the... targets then today. Yeah, we might have, we might have set a new world record for targets. Sorry, sir. Right overboard! Where? Where? A fearsome call. Helicopter rescuers now face the real thing. Man overboard called away. Helicopter out there. Looks like uh, they dropped one di diver into the water. So they've located one individual and they're in the process of trying to recover him. time in their lives have a great deal of difficulty uh, being alone, uh, being in a, in a strange environment in which they're asked to work very hard. We had a man uh, who uh, chose to, to jump off the ship. It was certainly not an attempt to take his life. We had him plucked out of the water in uh, just a few minutes. But using that technique to send a signal that I'm, uh, I'm asking for some help is something we discourage. But it does give an opportunity to reflect on the fact that we have people who are uh, are not as able to cope with the stresses as others, and we need to continue to keep our eyes open for them. Afterburner takeoffs are exciting, but in the pilots' minds, there is the nagging realization that a twilight takeoff means a night landing. The sun goes down around here. That's where the rubber meets the road. Nobody, nobody takes night landings uh, lightly because they're difficult every time, no matter how much experience you have. Every trap, every carrier arrestment takes total concentration, total focus, just a commitment to excellence. You have to draw on all the training you've had up to this point 
uh, all the experiences you've had uh, in order to uh, in order to bring it aboard every time they're at night. I don't think you'll find any pilot that'll tell you any differently in, in night landings. You look at the ship at three miles and it's just a dot of light. Take the pinhead of a needle and put it out in front of you. That's what the ship looks like at three miles. You don't know which direction it's moving in. You don't know how fast it's moving. You're closing on it at 130 miles an hour and it's moving away from you at 30 miles an hour. You only have so much gas out here in your jet. You know, your jet weighs a certain amount of, of pounds and uh, you can only carry so much fuel when you're bringing aboard the carrier. So you only get, you know, maybe two uh, looks at the, at the aircraft carrier before you have to refuel. A tense group in flight operations tracks the fuel status of the returning aircraft. Get the alert tanker going. Commander, go That's good. So we're just prepping in case we need Well, right now I have 4.5 uh, thousand pounds of uh, fuel airborne. And uh, guys start going around and around. I'm going to need more than that. So I'm just, uh, you know, getting the kid of the game here with that, uh, watching that air crew. The air wing commander and the captain want constant updates on the number of refueling tanker planes in the air. 4.5 available right now. We got a tanker. Right now, 4.5. We don't know yet. We have the reps here from each of the uh, squadrons to answer questions and emergencies as they come up and uh, aid the pilots and make decisions to get an aircraft for the uh, carrier. Uh, the mood's kind of tense because the weather's bad. In front of us, we have the status boards that to have the uh, current pilots who are airborne, uh, current fuel states, and uh, recommended tank states, and uh, uh, land times. Well, this isn't like uh, you're on the freeway when you run out of gas and you can just coast to the side of the highway. Here, you run out of gas and you end up going in the water. The pilots and the ship are, are battling against the clock. Every minute an airplane is on approach, he's burning about 100 pounds of fuel a minute, which is about 15 uh, gallons. It becomes so stressful down here just due to the fact that, that we only have a limited amount of time to get these airplanes on deck. And this limited amount of fuel is the difference between life and death around the carrier. If for some reason somebody can't land on the aircraft carrier, just due to the fact the pilot's having a bad night, he's going to have to go to the tanker. We can't tank them in time. We got to set up the barricade on deck. If we can't trap them in the barricade, then we take them out for a blue water divert, which is what they, they go out to about six miles, and then they bail out. You got about 15 to 18 seconds of intense flying, flying where there's no room for errors. You fly three and a half hours, a three and a half hour mission. You're tired. No matter how tired you are, you just, you got to get the energy from somewhere. Give me heads up, he's been on a six-hour flight. All right. Not for six hours. I'll say, yeah, I complain about my three-and-a-half-hour flight. Hard for me to get off the step sometimes because my knees are shaking so badly, especially on the passes, uh, the nights that are really dark and the passes are really bad. Uh, that's... That's something I don't like to experience, and it's, uh, I always think about that up there in Marshall when I'm ready to come on down. So. You waiting for some good news from home? Yes, sir. Well, it finally arrived. Congratulations. Cedric Jr. the second. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Cedric Jr. Football the second. Team. That's football team. There yes, you go. Sir. Eight yes, sir. Eight, Eight pounds, pounds, 21 yeah. inches. And uh, you got to read the last line right there. What does your wife say? He looks just, just like, like you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this is great. A oh, boy, this is great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I know you've been waiting. Uh, yes, I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's been a while, huh? Yes, I've waited long for this. Way to go. You don't mind that we kept you up for this news, do you? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank 
Thank you, thank you. I'm <laughs> My wife, she did it. We did it together. Thank you. Oh, I waited so long for this. Heading home from the Persian Gulf, the Carl Vinson crosses the equator, where, following maritime tradition, Neptune initiates those aboard ship who have never crossed the line before into the ancient order of shellbacks. His Majesty sends greetings. He has commissioned me to announce that it will be his pleasure to visit your ship today. It's my pleasure to have you aboard our ship. We're prepared for you and look forward to the arrival of King Neptune. Well, well, what a fine ship. But your ship is sorely infested with some serious, slimy polywogs. But I have several young members aboard who haven't been in the Navy long enough to have the opportunity to visit your domain before and become shellbacked. Captain, I must be severe. There will be no exceptions. Very well, Your Majesty. I'm ready to turn my command over to you for such time as you may desire. Now they are shellbacks. On the next voyage, it will be their turn to dish it out. America and loved ones lie just over the horizon. From those who made this voyage come varying reactions, some fulfilled, Others sorely tried. Everybody's all itchy about getting home. Just uh, everything's going to be different when we get back. People don't know how to act back in the States. 60% of my division want the captain's mask for drinking and doing stupid stuff. I know I lost about eight guys from my, my department during Westpac just because they couldn't handle it. You're out at sea for weeks. Months at a time, not even seeing land. Not even seeing a female, drives them crazy. They send them off to the hospital ward. Never see them again. But all of us that are left on the ship now, we made it. This is one of the last deployments for the A6 intruder. The plane is being retired. My airplane, the A6, is going away. Uh, I'm too senior to transition to another airplane, too junior to really uh, think about going anywhere else and making a difference in another community. So, in all reality, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be forced out of this business, this business that I've I've grown to love. I try and imagine what it's going to be like knowing that I will not be coming back to the ship anymore. But I am going to miss this. It's going to be, this, is, this has been quite an experience, and it doesn't seem like it's been 14 years, but it has. And with the demise of the A6, basically uh, what you have is a community of pilots that are going to be scrambling for orders. Two weeks after we get home from cruise, I'll be flying the uh, F-14 Delta. Uh, I've got a job. I can continue to do what I love, which is uh, fly aboard aircraft carriers, stay in the naval aviation, and be around these kind of people. Although on one hand, you're as happy as you can be because you're fortunate. And on the other hand, you're sad because your friends, some of your friends aren't making it. And you're like, you know, how do you can, what do you say to them? You know, I'm sorry, it, you had nothing to do with it. But on the other, you know, and you're happy, but you don't want to be too happy because you don't want to seem like, you know, <laughs> that, uh, I don't know, arrogant that you got that you got picked up. So it's uh, it's a uh, it's kind of a weird feeling, you know. Uh, I was able to get a uh, to become the uh, top nugget for the first the line period we had. Uh, after that, the things went pretty well, but I wasn't quite able to break into the uh, top 14. Just missed the last time, and 
I get a whole nother cruise to go plus work up. So next time, uh, maybe I'll be in there. Something to work for anyway. Well, I guess the three big mistakes that I made are still my three biggest mistakes. But they're becoming a little more easy to live with and a little more bearable. And I find I'm getting in a lot less trouble now, which is good. But, you know, as far as all that, nothing's really changed except for my outlook on it. I mean, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm swapping a, a deck poorly, as a matter of fact. I still don't like the Navy, but it's, it's easier to live with now. I've been accepted to a flight school in Oklahoma. And it's been a, it's been a joy working on these aircraft the past two years. Now it's going to be my turn to fly, uh, fly some. And uh, who knows, maybe even fly off this flight deck someday. When I left on deployment, I was focusing more on the challenges ahead. And now as I come home, uh, I can't help but think about uh, another part of the challenge that was always there, and that is to bring everybody back. We have not lost a life in an accident. There are many homecomings. The planes fly to their home bases. The ship docks in San Diego and San Francisco. First sailors allowed off the ship. Labor. He's in labor right now. Baby boy. Baby girl. Big boy, 10 pounds, 13 ounces. <laughs> big boy. Real big boy. Baby girl. Baby boy. Baby girl. <laughs> Baby girl.
When we first flew over the beach, feet dry, I was just so happy. Uh, you can't you can't put in the words that what it's like being away for six months. <laughs> Think uh -uh. about it. <laughs> that is way too long for anyone to be away from home. I got I got things to do. Now I have a life. It starts today. <laughs> perfectly contented. You know what? I don't care what the commercial says. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Frank Martinelli, promoted to Lieutenant Commander, will leave the Navy for the uncharted waters of civilian life. Lance Jorgensen, off to flight school. Slim Pickett will return for the next deployment. In three months, this great ship and her crew We'll go to sea again. Oh,